Our friends at Perla are big proponents of simple, long-term investing, and now they're rewarding you for being a long-term investor too. Perla investors receive points every time they fund their account and invest. The more points you earn, the higher your chances to win one of their weekly prizes or the big prize at the end of the month. To get started, check out the competition terms and conditions and open your Perla account today using the links in your podcast player. This episode of the Australian Finance Podcast is proudly supported by GlobalX ETFs and the launch of the US100 ETF, better known as N100. N100 offers Australian investors exposure to 100 of the largest non-financial companies listed on the NASDAQ Stock Exchange. N100 focuses on innovation-driven companies, providing a growth tilt to core portfolio holdings. You can learn more about N100, including reading the PDS and TMD by clicking the link in your podcast player or by simply heading to globalxetfs.com.au. Welcome to the Australian Finance Podcast. I'm Kate Campbell. And I'm Owen Rask. And we're here to give you the tools and knowledge to invest both your time and money better. If you're new, feel free to jump in with our Starter Pack series that aired in early 2022 or our Shares or ETF mini series. We've got plenty to share with you in today's episode, but if you want to catch us on socials, head to Rask Australia on Insta and Twitter. I'm also found at Kate Campbell AUS on Insta. And I'm Owen Rask AU on Insta. Just beware of the fake accounts. We'll never DM you about trading strategies or crypto. And if it sounds a bit weird, it's probably not us. And just one final heads up before we get into the show. This podcast contains general financial information only. Kate Campbell, welcome to this episode of the Australian Finance Podcast. It is good to be back on. We are back. And people are- So is the RBA. Scared. Yeah. The RBA has come out recently and said- not only have we just increased interest rates, but there's a big, very strong chance that they could go higher again, which is probably like those that tingling down your spine moment where you think, I've got a mortgage. This is not good. Yeah. Yeah. Or I've got any type of debt. This is not good. Mm-hmm. Or you're a renter and you're thinking, oh, no, that means my rent could go up again because my landlord's going to have a bigger debt. So what do we do about it? The only positive really is for the savers. That yeah, have yeah, the retirees. A good Live chunk. Dream. Or anyone that's been saving for a house deposit and has a good chunk of money in a bank account. Some of the interest rates on savings accounts are pretty good now. Yeah, they are really good. Even, yeah, just like standard savings accounts, 4%. You're like, wow, where have you been my whole life? And um, yeah, I mean, we were talking earlier today about younger people. And by that, I mean anyone like younger than 40 probably hasn't really experienced what it feels like for interest rates to go up like this meaningfully for inflation, maybe in the future rising unemployment. So, Kate, the the title of this episode is Six Ways to Recession-Proof Your Finances in 2023. Kind of says it on the tin, but the one word in there which really sends those shivers down the spine is recession. Can you explain in simple terms what that means? Yeah, I think most of us would have heard the word recession being thrown around a bit over the last year. It pops up in a lot of headlines in media, especially in the US. Uh, Whether it happens in Australia is up for debate, though Mm. some leading economists are leaning towards no. But a recession's basically, now I tried this joke on Owen, he thought it was quite funny, but like Owen's hairline, if you've mm-hmm. watched it over videos from 2016 <laughs> to 2023, yes, it is um, happening. things in the economy are going backwards instead of forwards. So mm-hmm. this isn't happening in Australia, this is just what a recession is. Yep. And so, and it happens for an extended period of time. Yes. So it can be, te- they say technical recessions are... Two quarters. What does that mean? Half a year. Yeah. So six months of the economy going backwards. Yeah. I was looking at the RBA's, RBA's website, so the Reserve Bank of Australia, and they said definitions for recessions vary greatly. They do, because so. then some people say it's to do with employment. It's the actual employment which drives the economy. Others say it's like inflation. So, yeah, it's really just has the, ha, has the country gone forward or backwards? Yeah. And we don't know when a recession will start or finish, which is why- 
there are lots of people that talk on the news about, oh, I think it's going to start in this month or I think it won't start till 2024 or it might happen in this country but not this country and it'll finish by this date. And so there's a lot of different opinions on Mm. what's going to happen. Yeah. And I think a lot of people, if you hear the word recession and the way the media pulls that trigger on you is you hear recession and you think like food stamps, standing in line, everyone unemployed. Now, that's not actually what a recession is. That's a depression. So those images of like black and white images of people standing in line waiting for food, that's depression. So that's like a t- total extreme. That's it. Those are extremely rare. Mm. Um, recessions are actually quite common around the world. It's just here in Australia where we're not really used to them. We had a, again, technical recession during COVID, but if you look at all of the economy and everything, things didn't, in fact, they went the other way. They like supercharged forward. So the reality is though that a recession causes pain to some people. Um, And in particular, it causes pain to people who have overextended themselves financially. So that would be people who took on too much property debt in particular, people who use buy now, pay later or credit cards for some type, some part of their budgeting strategy or the cash flow. People who have too many cars, a boat, a loan on Um, an excavator or construction equipment or too many beach houses, those types of things. Those are the people that tend to get really badly hurt. There are ways out if you are in that situation. So it's not all bad news, but the reason that happens, Kate, and and there's another group, which is the people that are on lower incomes. So that could be anyone. And it could be simply like lower income families, single income families. It could be people with disability that can't work full time. Can be anyone, right? Um, But the reason is, is because if you think about it, like if we do a budget, like if you do a budget, I did a budget, you'd come, you'd look at your monthly budget and you go, okay, I earned this much money, but then actually what I'm saving is like 10%, right? And if you think about it, and we'll talk about this, when when things go bad, and they, they only need to go bad by 10% for you to not have any savings. So even though people might earn a lot of money, unless they're saving, they've got a really good savings rate, it's really easy to crimp that to zero. And the people that earned less and lived just paycheck to paycheck are the ones that get hurt the most. Whereas people that have a lot of money, what do they do? Well, and no debt, and you don't have to have a lot of money, just no debt. What do they do? Well, they use a recession as an opportunity to invest, which is why we say on the show so much, like get rid of the credit card, get rid of buy now, pay later, pay down those crappy loans, get rid of that stuff you don't need. Not because it's fun, we do it so that when the bad times come, you're ready and you actually can benefit through that. So that's my spiel, okay? That's your spiel. That's my spiel. So now we've talked about some of the negative stuff. It's not all bad. Um, let's tackle some ways to get through it. Yes. So although it's less likely than likely uh, that a recession is going to happen this year, from what I can see in Australia, I think it's really important time to maybe fortify your finances and put some things into place that if if any financial challenges come knocking at your door, you are prepared to face them. And this stuff we talk about a lot, but I thought it'd be good to wrap it up all in one spot uh, so we can make sure we're ready for anything we face, really. Yeah, yeah. You should do this anytime, really. Yeah. So the first one, and this came to mind, I'm sure you've told me this like mm. in 2018 or something like this, but knowing what your ramen number is. Yeah. And that is your bare basics living expenses. Yeah. Is that what you explained to me years ago? Yeah, yeah. So this is when RASP basically exploded, um, not because of our doing, um, but the, the business fell to its knees, like completely. And one of my shareholders said, um, he said to me, oh, and what's your ramen number? I was standing outside of the supermarket, I was bucketing down rain, I was having a miserable day, a miserable month. And he said, what's your ramen number? And I was like, what does that mean? He's like, well, ramen's like the cheapest noodles you can get. So he's like, imagine you had to eat ramen for a month. How much would your living expenses be? But he was referring to the business. Like businesses can do ramen yeah. numbers as well. Um, and this is like the leanest cost base you can possibly have. Yes. So just those necessities in your budget. working. Yeah. So cutting out things like new clothes, coffee and travel and just saying, what is the bare minimum I need for rent for basic groceries mm-hmm. Uh, for my essential insurances, for any maybe debt repayments, things like that. What are those bare essentials I need to get by each month? So 
if something happens, like you lose your job, you know how much of a financial runway you have because you've already worked out this this number. Yeah. Or you know, okay, even though I lost my job, it might take me a while to find another job in my industry. I could work at a cafe potentially for a few months because I know I need to cover $3,000 of bare minimum expenses each month. Yeah, it's incredible, Kate. And we talk about this stuff, but it's actually incredible what people can do if they're motivated. Um, and sometimes, you know, you need to go through this adversity with your finances to get through it and to be in a better shape anyway, otherwise you'd never do it. Um, but like, if you think about it, let's say, I don't know, let's just say very round figures. Let's say you have $30,000 as an emergency fund and you estimate that your living expenses for your family are $10,000 every month. Well, you've got three months, right? But then let's imagine that you cut that to seven thousand dollars a month somehow like you do it and you pull it off and you got to seven well all of a sudden you've got four months and it's like orders of magnitude to every dollar you save and you reduce is a massive payoff and i think people just by doing this exercise like what's the minimum yeah and this could be just an annual thing even if you're not under financial pressure just go and figure it out and in a tough situation this knowledge is power because it is going to be even more stressful to work out this number if you're facing a challenging situation. So if you have this number written down that if anything happens, you can go, this is my basic living expenses. I have enough for three months. I have enough for six months. Then you've just got that information in front of you. Absolutely you do. And yeah, I mean, you'd rather know what it is than, you know, it's it's hard because some people want to bury their head in the sand. I could definitely be one of those people. But once you know, you just feel like this relief. You're like, okay. I know what it is, it's pretty bad or it's good, Um, I'm happy with myself. Like, as long as you know, then you can work with it. So, this could be like, holy heck, I'm paying like six different streaming subscriptions and I only need one. So, like I only use Netflix 90% of the time. Or my in-laws have Disney and I'll just, we'll just do a bit of a, you know, what's the old uh, parasite thing that just hangs off the side? <laughs> someone that just hangs off the side of someone else's Netflix or- What Netflix is trying to stop people yeah, doing. Yeah, <laughs> what they're trying to stop people doing. Sorry, Netflix. Um, but that's it. So, once you know your ramen number, then you can work out the next bit, Kate, which is uh, something we've banged on about, I think, maybe since the second episode of this series ever. Yes. Yeah, sorting out your emergency runway. That is another really important thing to do. And knowing that ramen number is going to help you figure this out Mm. because your emergency fund is the money you put aside that you don't touch, that if something happens, you can break glass in case of emergency and use that money for a a funeral, an airfare to a sick relative, to leave a job you hate, to leave a bad relationship, things like that. You want to put three to six months or whatever feels comfortable for you of those basic living expenses, so that ramen number, Aside, you want to open a high interest savings account, try and find something over 4% at the moment, and you can find that around mm. with not too many conditions attached, potentially not even a card attached to that account because you don't want to be able to access it within a second, but you want to access it within 24 hours. Yeah. So you want it to be, that's what we call what we call liquid. You don't want it to yeah. be like super liquid so it falls out of your pocket, but you want to be, um, you want to have access to it if you yeah. need it. So not a term deposit. Yeah, not a term deposit. Some people would do that. They'll they'll have $10,000 as an emergency fund and they'll just keep it in a term deposit for like six months. And you're like, oh, well, what happens if you need it? If you have to break it, then you lose all your interest. So why would you do that? Um, so savings accounts, offset accounts, if you have a mortgage, are the way to go. Um, yeah, I mean, I've had some pretty hard news coming through like from friends uh, and friends of friends last month and um, like a lot of mates have had to travel around to get to funerals and that sort of stuff. And um, I just like with the, when you look at airfares at the moment, right? You look at how high airfares are at the moment. Some of them can't afford that. So, like, this is where you have your emergency fund. So, you can do those things and you can be there and you can be there for friends or family and do whatever. Um, it doesn't, you don't need that much. This is the key thing to Kate's point. You don't need that much if your expenses are bloody low. Like, if you're doing the best you can from savings perspective, your runway, how long your emergency fund will last can be like years and you don't even need that much money. Like we spoke about uh, Dave, gal from Strong Money. He talks about this all the time, how it's like the independence of that money. 
uh, Aussie Firebug talks about it a lot. Like obviously they're on a different, slightly different journey, but um, they talk about it's only when you start on this process to saving money that you begin to realize it's not just like when you reach the end point, you'll feel good. It's actually the whole way along. And you might only get to $5,000 if your goal is 10. And even by $5,000, you're feeling so good. Then you go a little bit further and you're feeling so good again. So um, yeah, I just say like the quicker you can start to think about this stuff, the better. And hey, now <laughs> the beauty of inflation is now's a really good time to sell your stuff. If you have like a, a boat, a second car that you don't need, uh, whatever, go and get rid of it. If prices are really good right now, you can mm. always buy it back, you know, make sure you can uh, weather the storm, so to speak. Yep. So open that account, label it, figure out how much you want in there, write down your plan. Every month, I'm going to transfer $100 across, figure out if you can automate it so that mm. as soon as you get paid, $100 automatically gets transferred into that Perfect. emergency fund account and then repeat until done. Yeah, that's it. And if you dip into it, that's what it's for. So don't feel like you're doing a bad thing. Just replace it. Yep. That should be your first priority to replace it. Cool. Okay, number three. All right. The third thing that's really important to think about is focusing on paying off any buy now, pay later and high interest debts like credit cards, personal loans, anything, especially in two di digits. So if you're paying over 10% on any debts, really focusing on that first. Yep, absolutely. Um, yeah, I mean, we talk a lot about this. Uh, just about see a lot of people think that like credit cards can be used for budgeting absolutely they can I think people think that buy now pay later can be used for budgeting hey it's free money absolutely they can and they advertise themselves like that as well yeah but for the most part they're a net like a tragedy mm. <laughs> to be honest and they do encourage you to spend a lot more money they write in their marketing materials that users that use their services spend x times more exactly. than normal at checkout which is in one way helpful for the small business, but it's not really helpful for you. And the small business is paying quite a high percentage in fees. Yeah, especially for that buy now, pay later stuff. So, yeah, I mean, we're, Kate and I are sitting here on the podcast and we say, don't do it. We know a lot of people do, and sure, that's your thing. But the problem is a lot of people are vulnerable to this marketing and they're vulnerable to the, the lifestyles that the kind of credit card rewards things promote. And people like, um, people in the TV or on social media get paid a lot of money to talk about these things and recommend credit cards and all this type of crap. Um, and it's just, it's a shame because it's not until things get bad that you realize how toxic they are. Um, you know, if you're paying 20 to 25% interest on a credit card, there's no way that you can invest your way out of that. There's no, like, there's no legitimate investment ever that produces that return. So to, if you think you can like counteract, oh, I'll have a credit card, but I'll also invest. No, like just get rid of it um, and just sleep easier. That's what yeah. I'd say. So, okay, how can you get rid of it? Yep. One important resource to consider is speaking to a financial counsellor. They're free and confidential in Australia. You mm. can just Google the National Debt Helpline. There's multiple ways you can get in contact via message or phone or email. We'll put a link in the show notes. We also have a getting and staying out of debt course on RASC Education. That's also free. And we've done a couple of interviews in the past with financial counsellors if you want to yeah. try before you well, it's free, but bye. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, Nick, I'm pretty sure his name was. Um, he was brilliant. These uh, these people, like, really care. Um, so go and check out, speak to the National Debt Helpline. Uh, and the br brilliant thing is a lot of people, maybe in our community, we know this and we champion for our friends and family. But if you're new to the podcast, you may not know that if you have a financial counselor, they can actually bargain with the bank. They can bargain with the credit provider. They can bargain with your utility like your, your energy, they can do that for you. So if you're a bit shy, you're the kind of person that's a bit timid or hard, you know, you don't have those confrontational type conversations, let them let them do it. Like they'll do it for you. Yeah, that's what they're trained to do. Yeah, so let them do it. And they can, they really know the triggers to pull. Like, oh, bank, if you're a bank, you have to have a hardship, you know, clause in the, the contracts. Well, if you're a utility, you also have to provide services for payment plans. So they can do that for you and they know what triggers to pull at the right time for you. So yeah, uh, on your side. and that's something you mentioned there. Also, if you're struggling paying your utilities, um, water, gas, rent, all of that sort of stuff, if you're a few months behind, speaking to a financial counselor might be helpful there. Or 
They've also told me they're quite good at pointing you in. It, they might not be the right service for you, but they can point you to the other relevant government or nonprofit agency that can help you better. Yeah, there's so many out there. Like they, there are there are things you probably don't know exist. So let them be your field guide. Some of the things out there are like no interest loans to consolidate. Like there's some things out there that few people know about, but if you are willing to go and investigate, you will get it. So go and ask. Number four, Kate is. And I thought when you wrote this in the in the show notes, I was like, wow, this makes sense. Stop investing money you're going to need in the next few years. Yes. Why? Well, we say this in most episodes when we're talking about investing anyway, because investing is a long-term game. But especially when things are getting a bit tough in the economy and businesses slow mm. down, the share market might get a bit more volatile, companies might not perform that well. Investors might not be happy with results. Share prices might fall. Uh, You might see investments that you make go down in value. Doesn't always happen, but it might happen. And so this is another time, like most times, that you shouldn't be investing that you're going to need in the short term. Yeah. So this is potentially, as you said, the exact time for when we say these things, why we say them. See, if we said this same advice, don't invest money that you might need in the next three years. If we said that any time in the last five years maybe except for 2022, we'd look like idiots. Everyone would be like, shouldn't have listened to you, should have put it in crypto, should have invested in technology stocks. But then technology stocks fall 30% and there goes 30% of your house deposit, which you, by the way, need to do now. So you pull it out at a loss and you lose. Um, and yeah, I mean, it kind of speaks for itself once you give yeah. that example. But Especially your emergency fund. <sighs> yeah. yeah. And I yeah. guess on the flip side, if you mm. do have a stable income, you've got your emergency fund, you're out of debt, businesses might have poor results. They might not be doing that well just because they're in a in a recession, mm. but they're still a good business. So people like Owen and I as investors might go, okay, it's still a great business. It's just having a tough time. Yeah. And this is the, this is the beauty of what we're just talking about. In a recession or in like for most, like a typical recession, um, Good companies, like imagine something like Woolworths or Wes Farmers or Apple or Amazon, they're not going to die. They're not going away, right? But the reality is if you wanted to invest in those companies when times are good, you pay more for the shares. Mm. But then when times are really bad, you get a better deal, right? And so this is that whole cycle where you've got to kind of wire your psychology to be, well, I'm I'm preparing my finances for the long term, even if that means foregoing some return in the short term, longer term, I'm going to be able, I know, I feel confident I'm going to be able to buy something cheaper. So I'm going to hold off. And so that's what people should have been doing in the last two years. And now people should be thinking, well, I've done all the right things. I've saved my money. I've avoided credit card debt. I've done all that. Now, maybe I can start to think, well, things look a bit cheaper. And so this is where we invert the the, the kind of the, the, the motion to the logic and the problem is, though, Kate, that a lot of people still haven't sorted out their finances and they're still thinking about that second part where you go and invest. Yeah. First things first, put on your safety mask, uh, like your, your oxygen mask before you put it on anything, anyone else. Sort out your finances before you try and invest. Yeah. There's kind of like a logic to the order that we're going through each of these things in. Yep. Because things like that emergency fund, paying off debt, knowing... Um, your basic living expenses and even stable income. Like a lot of these things are important things to sort out before you start investing. Absolutely. Yeah. So yeah, I I could just imagine people going right now, they're thinking, I'll go and put money, I'll go and put two thousand or twenty thousand dollars in the Vanguard ETF or something. And then in six months they think, Oh, actually, we weren't saving any money. We've got this credit card. My partner's job is at risk. I'll sell now the Vanguard thing's fallen. They think they're a terrible investor when really it had nothing to do with their investing. Mm. It was just they didn't really comprehend what could happen in the near term. Yeah, and often if we're forced to sell investment uh, in a very short period of time when the market falls, we do learn the wrong lessons from that. We learn that investing's for other people, investing's gambling, investing doesn't work, um, rather than learning the lesson that investing is for a long-term horizon. Investing is not a short-term activity. I shouldn't be putting money in that I'm going to need in the short term, especially if I don't have an emergency fund yet. Yeah, I was interviewed. It was said I was interviewed um, last week, I think it was, 
Uh, and one of the questions quoted a study that showed that 200,000 200, Australians, and I think it was millennials, like younger people under a certain age, had pulled out of the share market. Really? Yeah, okay. 200,000. When you think only 300,000 were added during COVID. So mm. it's a lot of people that have gone in and gone, oh, no, and come straight back out. Yeah. And if you think about that, like that's a lot of people that are probably now thinking, oh, the stock market's like gambling. I watch these people on YouTube. They said it was only going to go up. Um, but it's not. That's just, that's because that's short term. Uh, and so, you know, the Vanguard ETF will still be here in a year. So you can go and buy it then once you've got your finances sorted. Uh, just sleep better at night. So that's yeah. number four. Yeah. And um, if you're interested in more on that, we've got the Get Rich Slow course and episode. Get Rich Slow. Um, yep. Yeah. On risk education, which might be of interest there. The fifth one is to diversify your income sources. So we talk about the importance of diversification a lot when we're investing and not mm. all having all of our money in one thing. So I'm not putting my money all in Apple stocks, or I'm not putting all of my money in just Australian shares. I'm adding a bit from overseas and in different types of asset classes like bonds and fixed interest. Yep. So many of us only have one income source, our nine to five job. We spend a huge amount of time there yep. um, and we don't have any other income sources. And I think it might be worth having a little bit of a think about, is there any other ways you can earn a little bit of extra money on the side? You might not want a side hustle all the time, but just thinking, okay, if something does happen, like I lose my income, my boss cuts my hours, I lose some shifts, um, or my company D- didn't can't- get the pay rise. Yep. Yeah, I didn't get a pay rise. I can't afford this more expensive school fees, the more expensive mortgage. Are there some ways that you can earn a bit more money on the side? And we did a giveaway recently and we asked our community members how they've earned a bit of extra cash. And some of the responses- there was a lot of responses. Yeah, that um, if this episode, this episode might go out and the giveaway is still open. So head to our Instagram. It was for copies of Glenn and Shell's Sort Your Career Out book. Yep. Um, but some of the responses, including assembling IKEA furniture via Airtasker. Mm. Oh, that's so good. I paid someone to do that. I would pay someone to do that. And for people those. love IKEA. It's like, this is like the great divide. Yeah. It's like people like love it and then people like absolutely hate it. I, I paid someone. I legit, like, I would pay them again. Yes. <laughs> Yes, house and pet sitting um, have come up a few times, even yeah. just saving on that rent cost. Oh, yeah. Well, if you're saving for a house and you can be very flexible, like um, I think it was Mimi wrote in uh, on Instagram the other day and said that, yeah, like you can save for a house as long as you have like a base to go back to, like your parents' house if you're younger or a friend's house. Or if you really need to save money, you can do trustedhousesitter.com where you basically take care of pets and it's free rent. A lot of times they're really nice houses. Mm. Um, just got to be responsible for some pets um, and you can save. Yeah. yeah. And I, I have personally known people who got paid to do pet sitting where the pet came and lived with, yeah, at that, their house. Yeah, that's a big thing too because kenneling, like boarding for dogs is so and cats is so expensive. Yeah. If you just get them to come to your house, it's like 40 bucks a day for nothing really. Yeah. Renting out spare things, room, trailer, car, swimming pool. Yeah, a swimming pool. Yeah, yeah, I remember that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, a lot of things can be rented out, and I think it's great to um, reuse things like that instead of yeah. um, just going to a big corporate provider. Well, there's a lot of gig economy. Like you mentioned Airtasker, but there's also like Uber. Um, a lot of people do find that they do have spare time. I was chatting to a guy earlier today just via um, uh, Zoom, and he was saying he's like, he's like, my philosophy on life is I still pay rent on weekends. <laughs> So he's like, so I work at least one of those days to pay for that rent. Right. I'm like, ah, oh, okay, cool. He's like, yeah, that's when I make all the cream on top of my income. I'm like, okay, this guy's done pretty well for yeah. himself. But he's like, no, I still work on weekends. Mm. He's like, I find work. I'm like, oh, okay, cool. Yeah. So it's like, because if he earns 200 bucks, that's a $200. It's basically his because all of his nine to five is paid for the other stuff. Yeah. Yep. So then he just treats that like that's his fun money. It's like a bonus. Yeah, yeah. So he'll go and do six hours on a Saturday or something like that. Um, which pays for a lot of his other stuff that he does. Yeah, someone mentioned uh, they'd done a certificate in personal training and did that on the weekends. Cool. Food delivery, lots of options there. Mm -hmm. Tutoring, gardening, mounting TVs. That was a very specific one, but also quite handy. I feel like that would come in handy because a lot of people would- Putting those brackets up. Yeah, like that's, it's pretty daunting if you don't know what you're doing. Mm. 
And I've done a few. You're putting of them, holes into your wall, and you also need a power tool, probably. So yeah, and if you're doing, if you're mounting it into bricks, it's even more mm. of a pain for people that aren't used to that sort of stuff. So yeah, go on. Selling digital resources, music lessons. So there's, there's mm. so many different suggestions, and we're definitely not advocating having a side hustle the whole time to pay for your basic living expenses, um, especially if it means you've got no time to do anything else. You still want to have a balance yeah, in life, but there. if times get tough and you do need a bit of extra income, this might be something you can do. So even just jotting down maybe a few different ideas that if you needed some extra income or you wanted to supercharge your emergency fund because you worked out it was going to take you two years to save up 10 grand and you kind of go, oh, I want to get there in 12 months. Okay, how can I get an extra five grand this year? I'm going to do a bit more work um, delivering food or... Yeah. Helping look after people's pets to get there faster. Yeah, there's so many things you can do. If you just look around, you'll see people that do this. I think once you get into this mindset, I don't know about you, Kate, but once you get into this mindset of like, oh, there's a problem, I could solve that. And you think like, oh, I could make money doing that. And it might not be a lot of money, yeah. but maybe it's something where you can like offer services to someone. Especially if it's something you already are good at or enjoy. Like you might already enjoy hanging out with animals, so pet sitting might make sense. Yeah. Whereas I couldn't think of anything worse. <laughs> well, the IKEA one's a good example. Some people love it, some people hate it. But even things like gardening for yeah. like family and friends. We had someone write oh, in the I other day. Oh, I missed that one. Yeah, there was a few lawn mowing and gardening suggestions. Yeah, there was someone who wrote in the other day too and said um, they live in a share house and they're like, I'll do the cooking and the cleaning for reduced rent, mm. which is pretty cool. Because they're like clean freak anyway. Yeah. So it's like no one else is going to clean to my standards. So <laughs> I'm going to do it. Yeah. But I'll also do some of the cooking. Not all of it. Some of the cooking. What's that worth to you guys? And they're probably busy, you know, whatever. Come home from their trade or from a professional job or whatever. And they're like, yeah, I'd love that. So there are so many ways you can get creative and save a bit of money or make a little bit of extra money on the side, which is great. Number six. Lucky number six. Kate, this is a good one. Yes. Relates to the book. Number six, start investing in your career and making sure you're invaluable to your team. So I think it's more important than ever, especially before you get to the challenging situation, you want to do this proactively, is giving your career some attention. So mm. whether that's dusting the CV off and updating it, um, reconnecting with some old people in your industry. Yep. Um, when I say old, I mean just like, Older. Uh, people that you haven't spoken to for a while. Oh, right. Okay. <laughs> S- I get sorry. you. I get you. Um, some, yeah, some uh, dusty connections. Dusty connections. Yeah, here we <laughs> that, go. That sounds worse. Yeah. I don't know. I'll, I'll move on. <laughs> We're getting there. <laughs> Updating your LinkedIn profile. That's a good one. Um, looking at your workplace right now, your current role, the role you want in the future. Are there any areas you can upskill in? Yep. If you want to uh, get a promotion at some point, or even if you're thinking of a career change or an industry change, are there some qualifications you can get online or doing an evening course that would make you uh, a more attractive candidate for your next step? Yeah. Um, and a lot of these are pretty low cost and or free. So, like, you can get, like, online certificates and stuff through places like Udemy, um, which, you know, uh, can teach you new skills. All you just need, all you need is the motivation and the time. Uh, and you can go and upskill and, and do those types of things. I think I've talked to you about this before, Kate, but when I was early in my career, I always had this really, this big insecurity around, like in an organization, I would basically look around the room and be like, how close am I to losing my job? And what I mean by that is like, what would, if something went wrong, who would go first? And then I could like measure how far away I was from that point. But I wouldn't just measure like in our business. Then I'd measure like what would have to happen in the economy or with our customers or with our suppliers or for me to then lose my job. Like I'd analyze it from like every perspective. It seems intense. Yeah, it was. <laughs> but at the time, in fairness, I was only a contractor. Okay. So I was thinking like, well, I'm a contractor. There's a reason. You're a lot easier to let I'm go. I'm easier to let go. Mm. I'm earning more money. It's good now. But what happens if things get bad? And these are the things that go through my head. So then I eventually took a job on PAYG full time, um, which was far less money. I think it was like- But did you feel more comfortable? 40 grand less money. And then I realized, I was like, hold on a second. Hmm. <laughs> I don't know if it's just the right. Like, You're paying for a bit more security. <laughs> yeah, I'm paid, I'm paid in a big way for this. Yeah, but it was the right step in my career. Anyway. But I just thought about that. I was like, oh, mm. like what would have to go wrong? And like it's just, like you said, it's just making sure that 
you can own processes, you can head something up, you can do all those types of things. Yeah, and I think it's just even having a look uh, at your company right now and going, what problems can I solve? Is there, uh, are they needing someone to put a policy document together in this area? Is there an area of customers that aren't being served? Could I create yeah. a resource or a course for staff or just being proactive and thinking about how can I um, proactively solve a problem that might make me stand out more to my team, not only helps the company, I get to learn something in the process, maybe I get to connect with more people yep. in the wider company that I don't know, I might get to network with people outside of my industry um, and just keeping evidence of all of this stuff, keeping evidence of customer feedback, internal feedback, so that when you go for something like a pay rise or a promotion, you have a file of evidence. And we had a few people write in saying they, um, some of the stuff from the pay rise episodes we'd had a few guests on in the last few years about having that file of evidence and making a mm. case for your pay rise, like your investment case, like writing down why you're worth the additional $5,000 investment. Absolutely. Having all that documentation there so you can and um, bring a really compelling argument to your manager. Absolutely. And, um, I mean, the thing, the very basic thing is, do you know how your company makes money? Like, you've please figure that out. Like, how do they actually make money? Because mm -hmm. if you know that, then you know that everything that happens behind the scenes is like to facilitate that, to make more of that thing, which is called money. So how can you solve problems around that? If you're in a small business, Maybe just really pay attention to the things that are going on and what your boss or bosses or managers are saying, what they're feeling, um, and then come back to it. Like, come back mm. and be like, oh, you know, maybe your boss's name's Greg. And you're like, Greg, like, I, you seem to be talking about this thing a lot. Is there anything I can do with this? Maybe yeah. we could do this. I, I'm happy to do it. And all of a sudden, you'll see their eyes light up. They'll be like, well, yes, mm. actually, now you think about it, that's a good idea. And that's, that's the conversation you want to have. So creatively now's the time to start prepping for that sort of stuff yeah and uh glenn and shell i mentioned earlier about the book sort your career out that's mm -hmm. a really great resource that if you are wanting a bit more guidance in this area 20 bucks for uh, a great career guidebook yeah that's it a lot of people don't spend enough time thinking about their number one asset being themselves yeah so and we spend so much of our week at our careers, like we may as well pick a good one. Yeah, pick a good one and be good at it. <laughs> and pick good people. I yeah. think that matters even more. Like, oh, absolutely. I could do a lot of things that I don't really like doing if I enjoyed the people I was working with. That's it. Like, and I, To be honest, I think more people swing the pendulum towards more money, less enjoyment. Mm. Just maybe, maybe, just think about that. Like how many hours of your life do you spend working? Do something you want to do. Um, yeah, and these also, are the people you're learning from, you're getting influenced by, you're becoming friends with. So you want to make sure it's a great group of people. Yeah, absolutely. And you can have that. You can have that. So, uh, okay, just to reflect on these six things. Number one, we had know what your ramen number is. Like, is it in a broth? Is it not? Like, how are you eating your ramen? Um, number two, emergency <laughs> runway. Kate's looking at me funny like, what did you just say? <laughs> um, emergency runway. Like, know how long your emergency fund would last if. Three. Focus on paying off the buy now, pay later and high interest debts. Things like credit cards, but also things like car loans. They might say 1% interest, but is it really? Uh, personal loans, also pretty bad. Uh, number four was stop investing money that you're going to need. Like seriously sit down and think about this. You can, you know, you still get your super and that's still investing for you. Like you can come back to it. Number five, diversify your income sources. There's this, you know, there's this belief, I don't know if it's a myth, Queenie talked about this not too long ago, about millionaires having multiple sources of income. It's true, like a lot of the people that are wealthy do tend to have multiple sources of income, whether it's dividends, whether they own investment property, they have a business, a side hustle, whatever. Number six was start investing in your career and making yourself invaluable to your team. Kate, if you look at all of these things, none of them cost you anything to do. A bit of saving, a bit of time, a bit of effort. A bit of effort. But, like, figure, but figuring it out doesn't cost anything. Yeah. Like putting in a plan to get to move on up in your career, knowing what your expenses really are doesn't cost you anything. Yeah. And a bit of preparation and being proactive with this stuff will mean that if anything tough comes your way, you will be able to face it mm -hmm. with a lot more in your corner. Yep. Don't break. Just make yourself like a fortress, like Kate said at the top of the show. It's um, anti-fragile. Any fragile. It's there what we go. look for in our investments. It's what we look for in our finances. Yeah. Make it so that you can't break. 
Kate, this was heaps of fun. Really important. If you like this show, please let us know. You can find us on Instagram. There'll be links in the show notes. Remember, there are some imposters out there that try and imitate us. Just be careful. Make sure you're talking to the right people. We're not going to DM you about crypto or trading strategies or something like that. But take part in the giveaway. If you do, there will be a link in the show notes to that too, if you do want to do that. Kate, as always, thanks for joining me. Thanks for listening, everyone. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Australian Finance Podcast. We hope you learned something new and were able to take one thing away from this episode. If you're keen to learn more, head on over to Rask Education and take one of our free money and investing courses. You could even become a Rask Core member for less than your Netflix subscription each month. And don't forget to subscribe for new episodes in your inbox every week. Plus, if you enjoyed the show, we'd love you to leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify and send any questions our way via the link in the description. And before we go on, did this podcast contain personal financial advice just for me? Absolutely not, Kate. Our podcast actually contains general financial information only. What that means is the information does not take into account your financial needs, goals, objectives, or even your situation. So because of that, it's important that you consider if the information is appropriate to you and your needs before acting on it. If that all sounds a bit confusing or you're still working out what your needs are, it's a great idea to consult a licensed and trusted financial planner. And don't forget to do your own research. This podcast was proudly sponsored by InvestSmart's Bootcamp for Beginner Investors. Build your investing confidence for only $49.50. Learn what it takes to be a successful investor with InvestSmart's Bootcamp for Beginners. This online course is self-paced over three months with live weekly webinars designed to help you achieve your financial goals and create wealth. To start your investing journey today, head to investsmart.com.au bootcamp or simply click the link in your podcast player.